He was a Catholic priest in the middle of an unwinnable battle. Yet, his dedication to his faith and his fellow soldiers has given him the title Servant of God in the eyes of the church. And soon, quite possibly, a Congressional Medal of Honor. We'll learn more about his life tonight, so please stay with us. Thank you, thank you very much, and welcome on this wonderful 4th of July, 2012. You know, we celebrate as a nation that a group of men came together with a lot of argument and dealing with a difficult situation, and they declared our independence from uh, the British Empire. But they did it on the basis of important principles that they knew that our rights were given to us by God directly to each individual. The King of England could not give us our rights and he could not take them away. Neither can any other government. They also mentioned at the end that, uh, of the Declaration of Independence that they embark upon this difficult task of gaining independence, but that they know that the same God who is their creator and the giver of their rights would also be their judge, and that they had to stand righteously before him in the process of gaining that independence, not only for themselves, but for the whole nation. And today, we celebrate in great gratitude for what they did along with so many other civilians and soldiers in the days of our, of our Revolutionary War to bring us the freedoms that we have. Let us cherish them. Now, our guest tonight is a judicial vicar for the Diocese of Dodge City, Kansas, and he's the Episcopal Delegate for the Cause for Sainthood of Father Emile Coupon, a military chaplain who died in a North Korean POW camp in 1951. So please welcome Father John Hatsi. Thank Father you. Hatsi. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's good to be here. I you actually work in a couple different dioceses, yes. don't you? Actually, w Wichita is my home diocese, so mm -hmm. that's where I'm from, and I help out in, in Dodd City because of the shortage of priests. So, and, and uh, your expertise is in canon law. Right, right, right. a canon lawyer. Um, and I, it was through that that I told the bishop that I'd be willing to help out on the cause for Father Capon if it ever got to, got to be that. So that's kind of what got me into trouble and got, got me more work to do. Yeah, but, so, but see now, look at you. You're smiling about being <laughs> in this trouble. You must enjoy this. Yeah, it, it's truly a great honor to be working on Father Capon's cause. Um, I'll start with talking about his name a little because people always ask me how to pronounce his name uh, because we pronounce it wrong in Wichita. Um, his, the name is actually pr pronounced Capon. Um, in Wichita, we pronounce it Capon. Uh, back in 1958, uh, there was a dedication of Capon, uh, Chaplain Capon Memorial High School. And at that time, Bishop Carroll mispronounced his name, pronounced it Capon, and it stuck. So, so in the Wichita Diocese, it's Capon, but throughout the rest of the world, it's Capon. So I'll probably... Now, it's, yeah. it's one of those names that's a little difficult because it's an East European name. Right. Is that not right? Right. He's uh, of Czech descent. He actually grew up in Pilsen, Kansas, which is a Czech community. Now, Pilsen is the name of a Czech city. Right, right. Exactly, exactly. Um, and the, the community that he grew up there in Pilsen, many of the people there spoke Czech as he was, as he was growing up or spoke Bohemian. 
Um, he went to his parish pastor, a father Sklinar, when he was growing up and asked him if he could uh, help him out in becoming a, a priest because he felt that he was called to be a priest. And, and just some of his background before that, he was raised on a farm, wasn't right, he? Right, um, raised, uh, he was born in uh, 1916, on April 20th of 1916. Actually, it was Holy Thursday of, of that year. Um, and when he was growing up during that time, if you think of history, uh, it was during the Dust Bowl days in Kansas is when he would have been growing up uh, and going to school and things. Um, uh, while he was at school, he was known by his fellow classmates. Um, I mean, it's being a nice guy. Uh, I kind of played devil's advocate in my role as Episcopal delegate, trying to kind of talk to people and see if I can find any, any dirt on Father Capon, but yeah, I've never been able to. Yeah, by the way, how good are you at being the devil's advocate? <laughs> <laughs> and what kind of training do you need for that? Well, I, I, I come from a family of nine kids. There so, you go, so. that'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> that did do it, that did do it. Uh, so anyway, but um, in talking to his classmates, I would ask them about him being a good student or whether or not he was a teacher pet because they would all say that he was a good student and they all responded that no he was just a nice guy and they said that he would go out of his way to help other people. Um, it was a three-room schoolhouse uh, uh, classes one through five in one, one room and six through eight in another and then uh, freshman and sophomore in high school in another and he said that that it, whichever classroom that he was in he said that he would even pick up on people struggling before the teachers would and he said he would go over and help them. Um, he was just a nice guy and uh, when he was there going to school, he would often ride his bike uh, uh, to school about an hour early so he could serve mass for Father Sklenar. Uh, so throughout his childhood, I mean, people knew of him as, as a good guy. Um, they said that they all, he also played some practical jokes growing up, so he wasn't by any means any goody two-shoes, but that he was just a good guy. Mm -hmm. um, and that obviously continued. I mean, that, that, that continued through his high school career. Um, as I mentioned, he felt that he was called to be a priest, but at that time the, the seminary tuition would have been paid by their family, and he knew that his family wouldn't be able to do so. Uh, so he went to Father Sklenar and he asked Father Sklenar if he could write a letter of recommendation to the Colombian fathers. Uh, the missionary priest would pay for their seminary training. Uh, Father Sklenar asked him why he wanted to be a missionary, and he kind of told him the reason. Uh, so he said, well, if we can get the tuition paid, will you study for the Diocese of Wichita? And Father Capon agreed. Um, so he went off after he got out of the, the sophomore year of high school there in Pilsen. Um, he went to Conception Seminary High School. Uh, that's outside of Kansas City. It's about an, uh, an hour north of Kansas City. Uh, so he went there for, to finish his high school career, um, stayed there for his college seminary. Uh, when he got out of the, the college seminary, uh, he was then sent to Kenrick Seminary in St. Louis. Yes, and which is still there too. Right, still there, too, still there also. And the, the people that I talked to that were classmates at the seminary talked about him being the same type of guy, uh, saying that he w was very unassuming, uh, that, that he didn't make a, or stick out, or that he didn't make a name for himself, but he was always there to help each other out. Uh, one of the stories that I thought was kind of neat, this was back when he went to Conception, uh, he and his father were in their Model T going back to Conception Seminary. And if you're familiar with that part of the country, it's hilly, a hilly part of the country. Um, so they are going and the gas tank in the Model T is underneath the front seat. Um, but as they would go up the hill, the, the gas would, would go back in, the, in the, the tank. So the, the car would die because they couldn't make it up the hills because they had so little gas. So they were perplexed on what to do. So his dad decided, well, we can get there by going in reverse. So he turned the car around and he would go in reverse. So the gas would <laughs> flow into the engine instead of flow out of the engine. So but see, that's I, one of the reasons I brought up the fact that he was raised on a farm. Because when you're on a farm, you have to fix things that's right. on your own and be very clever to know how to do things. Right. And, and that kind of cleverness is also one of the right. themes of his life. Yeah, and that got him through his priesthood and, and also his role as, as a chaplain also, um, that, that cleverness. I mean, it would stick with him through, throughout, throughout all of his life. Um, when he was at Kenrick, um, we had class notes, volumes of class notes. Um, and there is one remaining uh, classmate from, from Kenrick Seminary. And I asked him once about these class notes. And I said, well, these must have been class notes, things that the teachers handed out. And the guy looked at me and he says, well, what are you talking about? And I said, well, we have these volumes of class notes from Father Capon at, at uh, Kenrick Seminary. And he said, well, he said, 
remember when we were going to school. He said, we were going to school during the 30s. He said, there is no such thing as hand handouts from the teachers. And he said, no. if there's notes from Father Capon, he said that they were, they were notes that he took and, and notes that he would have typed up. And, and going through the, the notes, we did find a little receipt from a, a company that did mimeographs. And what Father Capon had done was taken his notes and typed them up, and then he would memorograph them and pass them out so his, his fellow students could use his notes to study with also. So I think it just kind of goes to show how dedicated he was to help, to help other people out. Yeah, it just was part of his right. way of being. Part of his nature. And he, he came from a decent sized family too, didn't well, no, he? No, actually he, he just had one brother. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, he had one brother that was about six years younger than what he was. Um, and uh, he told his parents that, that he wanted to have a younger brother. And, and I guess his mom was a very jovial person and she just kind of laughed at him and, and kind of laughed it off. But, but Soon after he told them, soon after he informed them that he wanted a baby brother, he had a baby brother. On so, the way. So that's there right. You go. Exactly, exactly. Um, so it was a small family. But Good thing you didn't ask his parents to raise a baseball team. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, because he was, he was quite good at baseball also. That's one of the things that the kids remembered from Father Capon when he came back after he was ordained. Um, he was ordained in 1940. Um, when he came back to the diocese, his first assignment was back at his home parish, uh, back in Pilsen, Kansas. Uh, one of the reasons was because he could speak Czech and um, the bishop knew that he would have to deal with, the, deal with his home people. Um, but the kids there remembered him coming back and they said that he was really like a breath of fresh air. They said that Father Sklenar, while he was a very good man, uh, was also Father Sklenar and that he was rather curt and he was, was uh, kind of from, from the old school and they said that they were refreshed when Father Capon came. Um, the first thing he did was went out and bought sporting equipment for the kids, baseballs, soccer balls, so that he, they could play at recess. And he would often go out there at recess and, and play baseball with the kids. Um, one, of the, one of the students said that he always was concerned about the kids having fun when they are playing the sports. And he said oftentimes he would start playing on one team and he said if the other team got real far behind, he would switch to that team so, to help them out so that the, he would make sure that everybody had fun. He said it wasn't a matter of, of one person not winning or losing, but he said it was important that everything, everybody had a good time while they were doing it. So. Now, he uh, was a parish priest right after ordination. Right. But he made a bit of a change right. along the way. What, what, what was the next step for him? Um, like I said, he was ordained in 1940. Um, and if you think of the, the situation at the time, just prior to World War II breaking out, uh, the military was starting to gain force in, in the United States. And there was an air base, Harrington Air Base, uh, that was about 10 miles away from Pilsen. And he first volunteered to go and say mass for the men there in Pilsen at the Harrington Air Base. Uh, and that's when he first got his uh, taste of chaplaincy. And, and he felt that he was called to that, to that lifestyle. Um, when World War II broke out, he did ask Bishop Winkleman, who was the Bishop of Wichita at the time, if, if he could be released to become a chaplain. And eventually he was released. Um, he did serve in, in World War II, uh, was served in the India and Burma theater. We were able to talk to one man that was still alive that had, um, that was with Father Capon there in India and Burma. And he said that by, by the time Father Capon got there, that a lot of the major fighting was over. But he said that Father Capon was always one that went to where the, he was needed the most. And he said that was where the fighting was. Um, he said while the ma majority of the fighting was over, he said there would be pockets of, of the Japanese in the jungles and in, in different places. And he said they were, were there hidden. Um, and he said, so as they were found, there would be fighting that broke out and there would be gunfire that would break out. Uh, and he, he said that we kind of laughed about it because he said there in the camp, he said, whenever we'd hear gunfire, he said, uh, it was kind of a, a running joke of, of everybody looking up to see where Father Capon was because they said he was on his bicycle riding to where the, the gunfire was because they knew that's where he was needed. Uh, so it, he said that, that he was always there with the, the men on the front line. Um, he also said that, that that's when he, they gave him the name of a soldier's chaplain. And they, he told me what a soldier's chaplain was. Um, he said, since chaplains do not have to be where there's uh, gunfire or, or up at the front lines, um, he said a soldier's chaplain is one that was willing to do so. Somebody that was willing to put their life on the line 
to, ser to serve with the men. The men. Yeah. With the men. Yep. And he said that was Father Capon. That was a description of Father Capon to a T. Um, so he... So he served very honorably right. in World War II. Right. Uh, he, he was in the military about 1944. Yeah. And uh, stayed until 45. For, yeah, 45, maybe 46. Mm -hmm. um, and when he got back, um, got out of the military, he came back to the Diocese of Wichita. Uh, at that time, Bishop Carroll was bishop in Wichita, and he asked him to go away and study at Catholic University using the GI Bill. Uh, so he went and went to Washington, D.C. and studied at Catholic University, and he got a master's degree in education uh, and a minor's degree in history. Mm -hmm. um, he figured that when he was going to come back, he would probably use that master's degree and um, probably teach in one of the high schools. But as you know, bishops have their own mind, and he came back to the Diocese of Wichita, and Bishop Carroll sent him back to his home parish, uh, back to Pilsen, Kansas. Uh, Father Sklenar, then Monsignor Sklenar, was going to be retiring, so he was going to appoint uh, Father Capon as the pastor there at his home parish. Um, he did serve as pastor for a few months, but one of the things that other always bothered Father Capon about being in his home parish was he felt that, that sometimes the people weren't able to approach him, especially for the, the sacrament of confession. Yeah, I mean, they grew up with him. Right, and exactly. They were his elders growing right. up and right. all that. And that, that, was his, that was his worry, sure. exactly. So he went back to Bishop Carroll and he asked him if he could be transferred. Um, so Bishop Carroll kind of had, had minds that, or something in mind for, for Father Capon, so he did let him be transferred. And he transferred and he went to serve as administrator in a couple parishes just for short times before he took on his permanent uh, position. Um, he served at Spearville, which is just outside of Dodge City. He served at St. Teresa's in Hutchison, which is just outside of Wichita. Um, and then he was sent back to be pastor at another Czech community uh, called Timken, Kansas. Um, and it was there at Temkin, Kansas, while he was serving there, uh, that the military put out a call for chaplains to return to the military. Uh, right after World War II, there was kind of a mass exodus of chaplains, and, and the military found out that there was that need that was no longer being met. He asked Bishop Carroll if he could go back and become a chaplain once again, and first Bishop Carroll kind of ignored him. Um, so it was about six months or so before he asked again. And then, then Bishop Carroll allowed him to go back into the military. Um, when he went back to the military, he went to serve in Fort Bliss, Texas. Uh, from Fort Bliss, Texas, he was sent to Washington State uh, to be sent over to, to Japan because of the, the Korean um, problems in Korea uh, going on at the time. Hadn't been escalated to a war yet, but they knew that there were, there were problems that sure, were starting. Sure. So this was in, um, uh, let's see, he, he joined the military again in 1948. Right. Um, and it would have been 1950 that he was in, in Washington be, being shipped out to Japan. Um, once he got to Japan, uh, we have many stories of, of people, of uh, soldiers talking about his, his job in, or his ministry in, in Japan. A number of people have come forward that said that, that he converted them, that he brought them into the church. Uh, there is one man who said that, that um, it was just a matter of circumstances. He said he had seven older brothers and sisters, and he said all of them were baptized. But he said, when I was born, he said, we are moving. And he said, I never got baptized. So he said, Father Capon baptized him there, there in Japan uh, and, and gave him instructions into the church. Um, he, he would actually give marriage counseling over there. We have people that talked about how they were struggling in their marriage and, and how he would remind them that of, of, of their marriage vows and how they need to be faithful to their marriage vows even though they're separated by, by thousands of miles. Mm -hmm. um, so he was always willing to help out the men in whatever fashion or whatever capacity sure. he could. Um, soon after he was there in Japan, um, he, they were shipped over to Korea. Um, one of the men that was in the, the prison camp with him, that uh, well, also served with Father Capon before they were captured, uh, was a man named Tiber Rubin. Uh, he's um, a Medal of Honor winner himself. Um, it was awarded to him just about, uh, probably about three or four years ago for some of the work that he had done in, in uh, Korea. Uh, but prior to that, during World War II, he was a prisoner in Auschwitz. And when they were liberated, he promised himself that he would do something to pay back the United States. When he was able to immigrate to the United States, he decided what he needed to do was join the army. Um, when it came time for them to be shipped out to Korea, he said the, his commanding officer told him he didn't need to go uh, because he knew of his history in, in Auschwitz. 
Um, but he said, no, that's where my friends are going. I want to go there also. Um, so I was talking to him a little bit, and he said, you know, when I was in the prison camp, he said, I was so far away from Father Capon, I was never able to see him in the prison camp. But he said, before the prison camp, he said, I want to tell you before that, he said, there was a battle going on. And he said, we were kind of all spread out. And he said, all of us were, were just kind of hunkered down into whatever ditch or whatever, whatever little sure. ravine we could find. And he said, for some reason, I knew that I was going to die that day. And he said, I was there kind of feeling sorry for myself, thinking, what have I gotten myself into? and feeling very bad. And he said, all of a sudden, he said he felt a hand on his back. And he said he turned around and he said, here it was Father Capon. And he said it was Father Capon. And he said he was talking to me and he said he, he was uh, asking me if I was doing all right. He said he always had fruit in his, in his pocket. So he said he had pulled out a piece of fruit and gave me something to eat. Um, but he said he started asking me and talking to me and reassuring me that, that there are other people around and that he was still doing all right. And he said, you know, he said it was so meant so much to me. He said here he was a Catholic priest and I was a Jew. And he said he had no reason to come talk to me. He said, I knew that he was a saint at that time because he said he came because he knew that, that I was struggling at that moment. And sure. he said he came and talked to me. And he said, <clears throat> he talked to me and uh, we talked for, chatted for a little bit. And he said, then he told me that he had to go off to somebody else. And he said, but before he went off, he said, do you want to pray? And he said, she said, I said, sure, I want to pray. And he said, then he prayed the Hebrew scriptures with me. And he said, that meant so much to me. And he said, I knew from that moment on that that man was a saint. Mm -hmm. He said, I've heard stories about what he did later on, but he said, I knew he was a saint even before he got it into that, and before we were captured. One, <coughs> one of the other elements, because you're talking already about uh, oh. him in the prison of war camp, right. but even prior to that, he was still a soldier's chaplain, right. going to the front line, and he got the bronze star, did he not? Right, he did. Um, uh, he got the, the Bronze Star for actually dragging some wounded soldiers out of the battlefield. Um, the soldiers that worked with him knew full well what type of person he was, and they knew that they could count on Father Capon. Uh, whatever whatever situ situ situation they were in, Father Capon was going to be there to help him out. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, that's what led up to his capture. Um, they were there in, in Korea. Um, um, the, the North Koreans or the, the Chinese communists had, had joined the North Koreans in their fight as right. soon as the, the United Nation forces crossed the 38th parallel. Um, nobody knew that they were going to be fighting. Nobody knew that they, the, the number of troops that were already there in, in North Korea, the Chinese troops. Um, so as the forces went to the north, they were surrounded. Um, and that's the situation that the 8th Cavalry Unit found themselves in. They were being surrounded. And their commanding officers told them to try to make it back to the south, to try to retreat back to the south to safety. Um, at that time, Father Capon uh, said that he was going to stay behind with the wounded. Um, we've had some of the, the men talk to us about it, and it, it seems like at, at this time there's really bedlam going on. One guy was telling me that while he wasn't captured, he was coming back from a reconnaissance mission when he saw this battle going on. And he said, everybody, he said it, it was just chaos. He said the Chinese were there, North Koreans were there, the United Nations forces were there. And he said it was obvious that uh, there was nobody that really knew what was going on. So there was just hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, and he said he witnessed Father Capon going out once again into the battlefields and pulling wounded back. And he had a, a, what had been like a foxhole that had been dug by the North Koreans in this, at this area. And he was bringing the wounded back and, and giving them protection in this, this, this dugout that was there. Um, and one of, the, one of the men that was pulled back into the, this dugout was a Chinese officer. Uh, so there were Chinese, the, a Chinese man was in there where, with the, the rest of the wounded. Um, there were some of the nor North Korean and Chinese um, soldiers that saw what was happening. So they were taking grenades and they were throwing grenades into this dugout and they were shooting into the dugout. And Father Capon knew that there was not going to be much hope for them unless something, was hap something happened. So he forced the, the Chinese officer to stand up and to yell at them to stop doing it, that they, were, that they would surrender uh, because, so, that, so that he could protect the men, so the men sure. would not be killed. Sure. So, so that is how the Father Capon wound up being, being captured, was because he was willing to stay behind and help out the, the wounded men while other people were, were trying to flee, flee to safety. And that was in November? Of 1950. That would have been November. Yeah, no, no uh, he was captured on November 2nd, uh, mm -hmm. All Souls Day of 1950. Mm -hmm. So um, unfortunately, many of the people that were with him in his unit that were trying to flee to the south, 
uh, for safety were also captured within the next couple of days. Uh, one of the amazing stories that we hear about Father Capon was him helping out one of, these, one of his fellow soldiers that, that was captured. Um, it was known at that time that the North Koreans and Chinese were not taking uh, prisoners that could not walk. Their intention was to march them to the north of Korea, to the prison camps that were being established on the border between North Korea and China. So if you could not walk, you were killed. Um, one of the men, a man named Herbert Miller, uh, still alive, lives in, in, uh, uh, outside of Syracuse, New York, um, talked the story, told, told, tells a story about Father Capon li literally saving his life. Um, he was trying to escape with several of the, of the other men, go, flee to the south, and he said, we are in a ditch. He said, our commanding officer and another man got up and tried to run out, and he said they were shot, shot dead. Uh, so they decided they would just try to scatter. Um, so he said they got up, he started to run. He was shot, uh, shot in the hand. And uh, he said the, the force from the shot knocked him back down into the ditch. So he said he was laying there and he said that he just uh, was trying to get up or started to get up. As he got up, he saw a grenade at his feet. Um, the grenade went off and it broke his, his left ankle. His leg is still, still has scars from the, the it just tore, tore the bottom sure. part of his leg up. Um, he said, I tried to get up and walk, couldn't do it. Um, uh, he goes on and he talks about his, his staying there in the ditch, uh, hiding underneath another dead soldier and trying to, to protect himself. But he said, then the following day, he said they were there coming back through and, and obviously checking to make sure everybody that was there was dead. He said he felt them, the uh, man with a gun poking at him and he said it was a North Korean soldier and he said he was yelling at me. He said, I assumed he was telling me to get up. So he said, I tried to stand up just fell back down. Um, so he said, the man was there with his gun pointed at my head. And he said, I know that my next thought was I'm, de I'm dead. Um, and he said, then he kind of heard a commotion. Uh, he said, he looked up again and he said, there was an American soldier pushing this North Korean soldier out of the way. Uh, he said, he looked again and it was Father Capon. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, Father Capon bent over and picked me up and started to carry me. Um, and he said, he said, I have no idea how he was able to do it. He said, I probably weighed about 20 pounds more than what Father Capon did. But he said, here he was carrying me. And he said, he told, I told him, he said, put me down. You can't continue to do this. And he said, Father Capon's response to him was, if I put you down, they'll kill you. So I'm going to carry you. So he wound up carrying uh, Herbert Miller about 30 miles to the first uh, camp where they gathered all the prisoners together. And he said, if it hadn't been for Father Capon carrying me that way, he said, I would have de been dead many times over. Sure. He said, sometimes he would put me down and he said, we'd, I'd try to hop al alongside of him. But he said, then he would pick me up and carry me more. So he said, he talks about it being the, the first miracle of Father Capon was, was the fact that Father Capon came over. Because he said, there is no, once again, there was no reason for him to come over to me. He said, I'm not a Catholic. He said, he said, he didn't know who I was, but he said he saw these men or this men, this North Korean soldier start to point a gun at me and he knew that I'd be dead if I, he didn't come over. So he said, he came over and saved my life. So he was just focused on making sure that he was right. at the service right. of these soldiers. Right. Exactly, exactly. And it wasn't a question of asking, are you Catholic? I'll save right. you. If you're not, I won't. Right. He just was there to be there for the men. He was there to be there for the men that he was serving, that mm -hmm. he was called to serve. Now, he uh, continued serving the men while he was in the POW right. camp. And it, to, so folks understand how dangerous this was. 43% of the prisoners in 1950 to 51 died. Right, right. You know, it's a huge percentage. Right, to kind of, and that was just in that, that first year of the war. By yep. the time the, the war was over, the death rate of American prisoners in the North Korean prison camps was 65%. Yeah. Um, so th in that camp, there are about 3,000 men interred in that camp. Only 1,400 of them came home alive. Mm -hmm. Most of them froze to death that first year. Um, we have a report, or some of the men told, uh, talked to me and talked to me about that, the plight that first year. Um, from the records they've been able to accumulate, they said that that was probably one of the coldest winters in Korea, probably in the past 150 years. Yeah. They said temperatures got down to between 30 and 40 degrees below zero. Um, the weather pattern, the, what, the wind just blows across the Korean peninsula coming off from Siberia down to, through, the, yeah. through the Koreans. Um, they, they talked to me about, well, one, one of them gave the example. He said, you know, that, that first, those first few nights that I was there, he said, I found out how bad it was. He said, 
the, the huts that we are put in, he said they are about nine feet by nine feet. And he said uh, there were at least 14 men placed in each one of the huts. So he said at night when we'd try to sleep, he said we'd have to sleep head to toe um, so that there would be enough room for us to, to fit in, into the, 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 the hut. Um, but he said that first night that he was there, he said there or the next morning, he said he woke up and he said he had to get up and go use the latrine. So he said he pushed on the guy on one side of him um, to wake him up so that he could get up and go outside. And he said he pushed on him and he said he was, he was dead. dead. He yeah. was frozen. And he said he pushed on the guy on the other side and he said he was dead. He was frozen. He said if it hadn't been for those two guys that night that froze to death, he said I would have been one of the ones that had fro frozen to death. And he said, he said, Father, he said, I'm telling you, he said, when I say frozen, I mean frozen. He said, when we were on burial duty, when we had to go out and take these men that had frozen out, he said, they were frozen stiff. Yep. He said, it was like carrying a cordwood. He said, two of us would take them out. And he said, one of us would take their feet and the other one would take their shoulders. But he said, they were just frozen stiff. And he said, it, he said, we just took them out to where we could bury them. And he said, but it, he said, I mean, they, people froze. We have to take a little break, uh, so time for that. We're going to come back because, you know, this is, um, as you can t see, uh, someone who is really a great chaplain and a great priest, and we have a little more to tell about him, and then we'll get some questions. So please stay with us. Welcome back. We have a nice group of folks here with us, and we'd love to have you come and join us as well. If you get a chance to be down here on a pilgrimage, you can be part of our studio audience, and we love it when you do. So contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966. That's 205-271-2966. Or go to our website, www.ewtn.com, and they'll give you information about scheduling for programs and masses, uh, how to get up to Hansville and places to stay down here. So come as an individual, a family, or as a parish group, like a number of people have, and we'd love to have you. Okay. Now, before we go back to our guest, because I want to interview him a little bit more, we didn't finish the story of Father Capon. Uh, but I do want to point out to you something that we have here uh, over in between us. Uh, <clears throat> a captain in the United States Air Force gave me this flag. It was flown during a combat mission in Afghanistan. And it's a good thing to uh, remind ourselves still that there are men and women who are serving our nation, giving incredibly of themselves in order to do that, putting family and career on hold so that they can serve in our volunteer military. And uh, we want to, especially on this Independence Day, we want to express our gratitude to them, to the uh, men, uh, the priests, who are serving as chaplains and the other chaplains of the other religions, as well as all the men and women who are serving in various capacities, whether it be combat or supply and other work, um, you know, to, to help us in this country. God bless them and do keep them in your prayers. Now, Father Hatsi, I do want you to, before we get to questions, you know, sort of 
talk about the, because we're, we're in the prisoner of war camp with Father Capon. Now, what, uh, and some of the service he did to save men's lives, Catholic or not, didn't right. matter to him. He was a soldier's priest. Right. What, what else did he do? He spent his time in the prison camp trying to pro provide food for the men, uh, trying to pro provide fresh water. Uh, one of the biggest problems was dysentery, which is what you get when you drink tainted water. Um, you have diarrhea and you're nauseous, you're dehydrated. Yeah. Um, so that was the greatest problem. And if problem. you drink more of the water, you get right. more you sick. You get worse, that, right. It's yeah. a circle. And as they get dehydrated, the men weren't able to take care of themselves. Right. So Father Capon would take their clothes off, uh, take them down to the river, oftentimes breaking through the ice on the river to wash their clothes. Um, he, would, he would break into the, the storerooms to try to provide more food. The amount of food that they were given, they were given about 450 grams of millet. A millet is that little round uh, seed that you have in bird food. Um, so that's all they were given to, to eat was about a pound of that to eat a day. So he would always try to break in and sneak into their, the storerooms to try to steal more food for the, for the men. You know, you know, when we talk about someone who's uh, in a situation, maybe we can use a different word than steal. <laughs> well, be before he would do this, before he would go on the, those, those rounds to get the food, uh, he and his men or the men that were with him, he would ask them to pray with him and they would pray to St. Dismas for his protection as he would go out and take Just food. Just so non-Catholics might know, okay. who was St. Dismas? St. Dismas is known as the good, good thief, the, the man that was crucified alongside Christ that asked right. Christ's forgiveness. And Christ told him that he would be with him in, in, his, in his kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, so he would pray to St. Dismas for his, for his own prayers or his, for his intercession so that he might be successful on these, on these raids when they would go out to try Raiding. to Raiding. See, now there's raids. a little more there military right. term <laughs> that gives it a, a moral neutrality. Okay. All right. So Father Capon raided, <laughs> raided the, the, camp, or the, the storerooms. The enemy store rooms. Right, to, yeah, to provide food for, for, right. his own, for his own men. Um, but one of the, the greatest things that he did that m all the men talk about was how he would break out and come into their huts to pray with them. Um, at no they separated the officers from the enlisted men. They were trying to break the morale of the enlisted men. Yes. Um, and at night, Father Capon would break through the, the fence and they said that he had a, a shirt that he would pull up and then he had a, um, an, arm, an arm of a sweatshirt that he uses as a hat. And he said he would pull that down. So he said, really, all you could just see was his eyes. And he said that he would, they would be there in their huts. And he said, all of a sudden the, the hut would open up or the door would open up and Father Capon would step in. And they said, first he would ask if everybody was doing all right, if they needed any medical help or if he could help them in that way. If he had any food, he would give them food at that time. Um, and then he would, would say, well, let's pray. And he said that he would pray with them. And one of the men that we spoke to uh, was an Episcopalian. And he said, it didn't matter who you were. He said, Father Capon would come into the huts and he said, he had us of Protestants, he had the Catholics, he had the Jews, he had those people that were the Muslims. He said, he had everybody praying the rosary. So, so he, said, he said, it didn't matter. He said, he was there to pray with us. But he would sneak from hut to hut to, to pray with them. Um, uh, Another side story is Father Capon, when he was over there, he had a pipe. And one of the men said that, that he would take his pipe and he would light up his pipe and then he would pass his pipe around so everybody could have a, a puff of, of pipe and, or a puff from his pipe. And he said, Father, he said, you know, he might have had tobacco for those first couple of weeks. But he said, after that, he said, I don't know what, what we were smoking. But he <laughs> said, it wasn't tobacco. So he said he figured it must have been just the grass that, that he had gotten. But so that's another story. But, but he was willing to go out and to go out of his way to, to help his men. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, we, um, I want to make sure we get right, to some right. of our questions. Um, you know, his own life was lost right. in the prisoner of war right. camp. How did that happen? Um, he was injured. We know that he had a blood clot in his leg that the doctors forced him to be on his back and ele ele elevate his leg. Um, these were the American doctors that were there. Um, he had some kind of an infection because for the last month or so of his life, he had to wear an eye patch over one of his eyes. Uh, he had dysentery himself. He suffered from pneumonia, um, but he was on the mend. I mean, he had suffered through all of this and he was finally getting better. Uh, but that's when the North Koreans and Chinese found out about it. So they came to take him away uh, because they wanted him dead. They were afraid of him. All, the, all the, the fellow prisoners talk about how they were afraid to do anything to Father Capon because of the repercussions from the, the, the prisoners. He, they were afraid that 
if they did anything to Father Capon, that there would be an uprising. By the prisoners. Uh, by the prisoners, by the prisoners, exactly. So they were, the North Koreans and Chinese were going to use this as an opportunity to make sure Father Capon was out of the way. They came and they told him that they that told his fellow prisoners that were taking care of him that they were taking him to the camp hospital. The camp hospital was known as the death house because people did not come out of it alive. Uh, you were taken up there and you were placed there, not given food, not given medication. You were taken there to die. Um, once again, there was kind of some bedlam broke out when his fellow prisoners tried to stop him and and, and um, stop the, the North Koreans and Chinese from from taking him away. Um, Father Capon spoke up and he said, no, stop. He told him to stop and he said, uh, don't hurt yourselves on account of me. And then he started in naming individual prisoners, friends of his. And he, he told one, he said, Ralph Nardella, uh, um, who helped him out with the prayer services. He said, you know how to pray, you keep the men praying. To another one, he would say, say he told him um, um, that you need, you need to help keep getting food, uh, keep raiding for the food uh, so that you can feed the, the prisoners, keep getting them clean water. Uh, to another one, he said, he said, Mike, he said, don't cry for me. He said, I'm going to where I've always wanted to go. And he said, when I get there, I'll be praying for you. Um, they took him off to the death house and about three days later, um, he passed away there in the death house. Uh, we do have reports from one man that was there, was there in the death house um, that was able to make it out alive. He talked about how the death house was a bombed up pagoda. And he said, we just had markings on the floor where we were supposed to stay. And he said, but at one end, there were some small rooms and they put Father Capon in one of those rooms. Um, he said they brought in some food, some rice in a, in a bowl. And he said, that's what we were supposed to eat. But he said that for Father Capon's, they put his there at the doorway. And he said he knew that Father Capon was too weak to come up and, and uh, take the food. Um, and he said, uh, so he tried to go over and take it into Father Capon and they wouldn't let him. Um, but he said it was about three days later when, when during the night Father Capon passed away. Mm -hmm. so. So, so he died and you know, this is something that uh, uh, some congressmen from Kansas are now petitioning right. for him to get the Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, the Congressional Medal of Honor, actually, the, the call for it began with the fellow prisoners that came out of the prison camp. From the moment they came out of the prison camp, they started telling the story about Father Capon. They wanted the, the Medal of Honor to be given back then. Uh, for whatever reason, it wasn't. But currently, uh, Congressman Pompeo from, from Kansas, along with the senators, uh, Senator uh, Robertson is, is one of the ones that, that's helping out. Um, but all of them are, have gathered together. And um, it has been approved by Congress. It's been approved by the Department of Defense. Um, uh, our, our word was that, that um, um, uh, Panetta has, has now also approved of it. So, so it's so resting it's in the White House. Up, up with the up President with the, Obama. W yes, up with the President. So we're kind of waiting, waiting for, for that to be awarded someday. All right. All right. And he would be uh, the fifth Catholic priest to get it. I if he gets think it. so. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. that's right. Yeah. Out of eight chaplains altogether. Right, right. Of eight all chaplains all, right, right. So. Let's get some questions from our studio audience. Uh, sir, where are you from? Uh, Jim from Sugar Grove, Illinois. And your question? Um, Father, to your knowledge, are, are Catholic uh, priests in the armed forces being given orders that they can't comply with for reasons of faith? Uh, right now, we, the chaplains are not forced to do anything that's outside of their faith. Um, the current laws and the current regulations protect chaplains so that they are not required to do anything that goes against their faith practice. Mm. Uh, so for the time being, that is not a worry. Um, there have been some challenges to that, but like I say, right now, it's not a worry. But it is something that the chaplains are very concerned with uh, because of laws and because of legislations. One of the reasons why um, that we have there has not been that situation is because currently uh, the United States doesn't have any different uh, marriage laws. The, the United States as a general, there's no national marriage laws. There used to be the Protection or Family Act uh, that, they, that is still kind of in place um, uh, that, that they are still going by. But if that changes, then that might be a problem. So, and, and it would be a problem in that uh, because of n now allowing uh, people of same sex attraction right. into the military, that uh, if uh, same-sex marriage is legalized throughout the states, then chaplains may be, may be required uh, may try right. to try to force them to do military right. weddings between same-sex couples, right. and that would be against 
the religion, right. uh, uh, religious of a number right. of religions. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So that would be a question. Yeah, yeah. So cur currently, no chaplains are forced to do things outside of their faith right. practice. Right. So. Okay. We have another question. Where are you from, sir? Uh, Galleon, Ohio. All right, great. And your question? Are there, uh, have there been other military chaplains whose causes up for canonization? Yes. And as a matter of fact, there's one that is active right now, Father Capadano. Um, his cause for sainthood is, is, I think, being picked up by the military archdiocese. He was a, a Marine chaplain uh, that served in Vietnam. Uh, I just know a little bit about him. I know that he was uh, serving his men, and I believe he died while he was administering last rites yes, there on the battlefield. That's right. So he was a, a Marinol priest from New York State somewhere, I believe. And, uh, um, uh, but no, so his, his cause for sainthood is being considered did, also. Did he also win uh, some medals? He, he has a medal of honor also. All yep. Right. Yep. yep. And where are you from, young lady? Um, Mansfield, Ohio. Great. And what's your question? Um, how many years does it take for him to be canonized a saint? That's a good question. I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> um, I began my work on well, Father. Well, first of all, there's a minimum, is there not? That, that um, before a cause can be opened. Yes. <laughs> I, think, I think it's a five-year. A five-year yeah. five minimum. Um, when um, the cause for, for sainthood is opened up, we, we officially opened up the cause in 2008 in the Diocese of Wichita. Uh, we officially closed our diocesan phase of that cause July 1st of 2011. So during that time, we are trying to gather all the information. All that information is now over with the Congregation for Saints in Rome. Um, and then we work on church time, um, which is kind of different. We're th different than our, our, th our thoughts on time. Uh, so there's, there's well, no real... that's the advantage of being 2,000 years old. That's right, exactly. Mm -hmm. but, but the reason, the reason, I mean, a lot of people I know are kind of frustrated or ask me, why, why can't they tell us to give us a, a timeline and stuff? And it's like, well, we want the church to do their job because this is something that is of great importance and we want there to be no question whatsoever. If, if he is named a saint, we want it to be above, repro that statement to be above reproach. Repro Matter of fact, we've got some pictures we've just been showing of the crate of materials <laughs> that was sent over to Rome for the canonization. So they have to read through That's all right. that. That's right, I think it was 289 pounds. After, uh, when we got it shipped over that night, I was having nightmares. I, I was thinking that there's gonna be a, a freighter going from, from New York to, to Rome, and there's gonna be pages just fall, fall, flying out the back <laughs> of the freighter, and they're gonna call up and say, the crate was empty. <laughs> but, but, but that didn't was, happen. That didn't happen, yeah, that yeah. didn't happen, no. So I that was my you, nightmare. I hope you kept copies yeah. of everything. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 So as, as for a timeline, we don't really know. Um, we do know that it is progressing. We are currently working, or we've just opened up, uh, two different tribunals to investigate two alleged miracles. Uh, so the miracles will be being proved as they are uh, going through the, the papers. Right, um, right now, the postulator is working on a positio, which is the story of his life. Uh, it will be given back to Bishop Jekylls in Wichita, and I hear that he will present it uh, to the Pope and ask for beatification. Okay. So um, hopefully that'll be within the next year or a couple of years. Okay. So. All right, thank you. We have uh, another question here. Ma'am, where are you from? Crestline St. Joseph's Church. Great. And what's your uh, question? If Father Capon has any living relatives at this time, older living relatives. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, his brother passed away last year, but he still has uh, his sister-in-law, uh, Helen Capon, um, uh, is still alive. And they have about five kids that are still alive. So he still has nieces and nephews that, that are alive who are very, very interested in his cause going forward also. So, yeah. They never would have known him though, would they? No, uh, no. Um, of course, Father, uh, uh, he witnessed the marriage between his brother and, and oh, Helen, he? between Eugene and Helen. Um, uh, but that was kind of the last time, or, or around that time was the last that they had seen of him. All so. right. We have another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Grand Prairie, Texas. And what's your question? I was stationed in Korea in 1977. So I'm inter interested to know where, uh, where the camp, the prisoner camp was located at. The prisoner camp was uh, on the Yalu River. It's the border between North Korea and, and China. Um, it was, he was in prison camp number five. Um, so they developed a number of prison camps that were up there in the northern part of, of Korea. 
Um, that, but there were a couple other camps that were not as far north that were kind of holding camps that they would march from, from them from one camp to the other, then ultimately up to the, the prison camps along the border between North Korea and China. Yeah, and that's, uh, you know, the, the Yalu River area uh, still is the border between right. North Korea and China. Right. Uh, and that was, uh, uh, you know, it's even colder right. than, say, a place like Seoul. Yeah. You know, so it was uh, right. very different. Now, um, you know, one of the things that in your description is that uh, the lack of food, I mean, a pound of millet, right. ba basically bird seed, right. uh, is what they were given, you know, in a day. Uh, I mean, there are people who eat a pound of meat at one sitting, but there was no meat. Right, no meat. No, no. Uh, no nothing, nothing, and just bird seed. Right. So this was really a, a war crime right. uh, because, you know, the prisoners of war were to be treated, you right. know, decently. Yeah. They didn't do that. Right, right. It was a starvation diet. And one of the prisoners did talk to me about it and he said, you know, I can't say that I hate the Koreans, the North Koreans and the Chinese because he said, actually, he said they did not have it much better than what we did. He said, while they did have more food and stuff, he said, they were hurting just as we are. And he talked about one of the first things that they would do when they were captured is he said, usually they stole our shoes because he said their, our shoes were better than what theirs were. Um, so he said, don't get me wrong. He said that the North Koreans and Chinese were suffering also, um, but it, it wasn't as bad as what, what the prisoners were put through. Yeah. So. You know, it, it's very important for us to understand because uh, one of the attitudes in communist regimes is that the individual is unimportant right. compared to the thrust of history and that they see themselves as being the major thrust of history to make the world communist right. and individuals were completely expendable on their side and the enemy side. No right. sense of dignity uh, that's, that's one of the, the aspects of atheism. Right. Um, one of the things that Father Capon was known for in the prison camps was every day they had to go to indoctrination sessions. Uh, and many of the, the captors, many of the, the commandants of the, the prison camp had been over in the United States and had studied in the United States so they could speak English. But the fellow prisoners talk about how Father Capon would, would stand up and he said he wouldn't yell at him, he wouldn't be angry with him, but he said he would refute everything that they had said. Mm -hmm. And he said the, the, one of them talked about the, the camp commandant himself, a comrade's son, um, and they said he used to get so mad. They said he would be up there on the podium and he said he would literally be jumping up and down and telling Father Capon to, to qu quiet down, to, to be quiet, that he was wrong. And uh, so, he, so it was uh, uh, what, they had, what they had tried to do to, to indoctrinate them or try to convince them that the ways of the West were, were a terrible ways and ways of error. Right, so. right. And, you know, it, there's nothing like refuting a communist or right. an atheist to right. really get them mad. Right, no, exactly. They don't like that one. Better. Exactly, yep. Well, we want to make sure that uh, you can find out some more information about Father Emil Capon. You can contact Father Capon Gill. Now, Capon is spelled K-A-P-A-U-N. K-A-P-A-U-N. The Father Capon Guild, the Catholic Diocese of Wichita, and that is at 424 North Broadway, Wichita, Kansas, 67202. There's also a phone number you can call, 316-269-3111. Or you can also go to the website, Catholic Diocese of Wichita. Make that one word, Catholic Diocese of Wichita.org. And you can find out more about Father Capon and the progress of his cause. 
Uh, so that's a good place to get some more information. And you can find out some things on the internet. Right. Uh, you know, I, I came across some interviews with you and some right. other articles uh, about Father Capon, and it was a uh, uh, very, very good thing. As a matter of fact, there's also fathercapon.org. Right. I almost right. forgot about that. And it's just F R K A P A U N dot org, fathercapon.org. Right. Well, you know, the hour is just flying by. <laughs> you know, it's been great to have you here to share this Independence Day with us uh, and to talk about something, someone who combined the virtue of patriotism and with generosity, kindness to others, and his Catholic faith. And I appreciate that. Exactly. Uh, you were able to do that with us. I'm thrilled, thrilled to be able to be here. It's always good to talk about Father Capone. Why don't you join me in blessing our audience. May the Lord bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And again, remember that this network is brought to you by you. You make it possible. So please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And we'll be able to pay all of our bills too. God bless you and thank you very much.